It's a good day for some good news. In this world, you will have trouble, but take heart. <clears throat> I have overcome the world. That's Jesus' good news to us in John 16, 33. As we face this new day and all it has for us, we find courage and hope in the only trustworthy words available. Tell the adventures, explore. The Bible. This morning we're in Colossians chapter 1. We listened to it together. And now we're going to talk about what it has, what it means for us as full-time RVers, how it affects our lives, and how we interact with the world. So, Jen, what is the Holy Spirit speaking to you today? Um, so, <clears throat> Paul writing this letter, and he's so he's talking, and he says there's a lot of suffering to be entered into in this world. The kind of suffering Christ takes on. I welcome the chance to take my share in the church's part of the suffering. When I became a servant in this church, I experienced this suffering as a sheer gift. God's way of helping me serve you, laying out the whole truth. Um, the part that stands out to me is I experienced this suffering as a sheer gift. I've been battling with this whole suffering thing some days you just I just want it to stop like when does this end when do I get to be happy when does the suffering stop because it seems like every day there's something <clears throat> um, but to see that Paul he experienced this suffering as a sheer gift so the suffering's not going to change because that's just part of life every day, right? Things happen every day. Um, or as I like to say, shit happens to everybody. Um, maybe I need to look at my perspective on, on what's going on with that. What am I learning out of it? What, what does it mean? What... I think before any of that is just accepting that it is because it's that battle of not wanting to accept that that is that what is that suffering is mm -hmm. is where I'm getting tripped up so Paul teaches is teaching you that because suffering exists this is how he handles it mm -hmm. you can handle it the same way is that mm -hmm. what yes which is different than how you've been doing it how yeah I um, I would either distract myself completely from it from the suffering mm -hmm. or I would um, you know there's got to be a solution in here so I would just kill myself trying to find a way to fix it So for me, as I, as I look at this, Paul's specifically talking about going to a church, being with people in that church, and trying to do what he can to help that church. And so he's not going to fix the church. He's not going to force the church to conform to what he's saying. He's not going to... He's not a tattletale like... Mm-hmm. Look at all these things you're doing wrong. Right. He's not coming in with judgment. Yeah. He's coming in with the love of Christ. And so um, I think it's fascinating because more often than not, we all get hurt by something that happens in the church. Someone in the church hurts us. And then we blame the church as a whole instead of that person. And we don't accept the suffering. I know I've been in this situation a lot. I've gone to many churches. I've worked for different churches. And it's very easy to decide that what one human being did that I may have misunderstood that caused me to get hurt is the fault of the entire church and then blame the entire church when really I'm not going and communicating with this person, having a conversation with them, trying to figure out what happened or how I may have misunderstood. I'm just going to blame the church. It's their fault. And and not accept that suffering. And in the season that Jen and I are in, 
we're dealing with inner vows and how they have caused us to try to control the amount of suffering that we go through instead of mourning, grieving, accepting the suffering that we're going to go through. And Paul says that the suffering is a gift. And what a way to think about it. What a way to reframe how the things that happen that we don't like are actually good for us. Um, anything else on that? I'm thinking of one example for us. Okay. <clears throat> in particular in our marriage. So mm -hmm. we, uh, we bought this travel trailer and we did some remodels and that was great. And then we didn't work on it for a while. And so it's, you know, there's repairs that have to be made. Forgetting that that is a normal process of any home, you know, feeling like, uh, I'm just going to look at new rigs. Like, <laughs> I, I'm just going to talk about getting a new one. I'm just going to complain about all, how horrible this is. You know, like, what did you get me into? Or be mad at you or whatever. Um, and it's not just the working on the, on a rig that, you know, we could look at it as a chore and we could look at it as, um, you know, I hate doing this. I, you know, if we only had more money, we wouldn't have to do all this and, you know, all the things that have gone through my mind. But the reality is, is that when we, you and I work on the trailer together, it brings so much more to our relationship. It's not even about the repairs so much as the gift is what it brings to our relationship to be able to figure out how to work together and how to lead and follow well and um, how to communicate how with to each communicate other. with each other oh oh <laughs> um, learning new skills too you know working together to solve a problem and um, I think that's where the gift is. That's what, that's what it reminded me of. Excellent. Something that stood out for me um, in the message version of the Bible, one of the headlines before verses 3 through 5 is working in his orchard. And then Paul talks about the lines of purpose in your lives never grow slack, tightly tied as they are to your future in heaven, kept taut by hope. And what I always think about is... Um, so we just finished Philippians where it was very business oriented. And so he was talking to people whose main focus in life was business. And then in Ephesians, which we read before that, um, it seemed like the people in Ephesus, which is where the letter to the Ephesians goes to, they were so concerned with authority. Who's in charge? What is the hierarchy? Who it, it was, it seems very religious. Um, and then, like I said, Philippians was very business, and now we're coming into, it seems like a group of people who work with the dirt, work with their hands in the dirt. Um, they know what hope is because they plant seeds and then they hope they're going to get a harvest, and they don't know what's going to happen. They just have to have enough faith and hope to believe that something good is going to happen. And so it's so interesting to me that Paul is able to talk to them about the lines of purpose in your lives never grow slack, tightly tied as they are to your future in heaven, kept taught by hope. These are people who are capable of keeping their mind on heavenly things, on having that faith, on hoping that God is going to take care of them. And it's because they're so tied to having to work in the dirt, having to have faith and hope throughout every moment of their lives. They're still great at business. Once the, once the crop comes in, they're going to have to sell the, the crop. They're going to have to do all the business things, but it's not their main focus. Mm -hmm. And so one thing that we keep talking about is how different books of the Bible will be, might be more helpful to certain people than others because they were written towards people who are in similar situations. And what do you got? <laughs> I was thinking, like, do I know what that feels like? And I do on a much smaller scale. Okay. Much smaller scale. Excellent. So I'm a hairdresser. 
and uh, I specialize in color behind the chair and um, I'm known as the girl who can fix anything like I'd be the girl in my town that if other hairdressers couldn't fix a hair color they'd be like call Jen if anybody's gonna tackle it she's gonna do it so um, but the thing is is that I'm calm and I'm good through the formulation I'm good through the application but as soon as that colors on I am the most impatient person and it's that it's it's that hope because although I you know I have 30 years behind me and I've taught color for many years and and all of those things there's always an unknown always and um, it, you have to have hope you have to believe that, that that it's going to turn out how you thought it was going to turn out uh, or that you have enough skill to make adjustments if it doesn't um, and uh, I'm laughing because it's it's some days it's difficult to have hang, hang on to that hope I was also thinking that um, in well, hold on just a second yeah. on that just because I may have heard you incorrectly I heard you say you get impatient and that's that hope oh no and so I'm I'm confused about no. the connection between those two could you just clear that up for me please I get impatient but because I want to rely on myself mm. okay and you don't that's the point where you no longer have control yes. over what's going to happen with the color so you can either choose to be impatient mm -hmm. or you can choose hope. Yes, oh. exactly, exactly. Um, I think as stylists, we all do something different during that time as well. Okay. Um, uh, this last place that I worked at, many of my coworkers, in fact, all of my coworkers would leave the room. Once the color was on, they would leave the room go to a safe space like <laughs> it was the patio where all the stylists could go and not not worry over it for people who don't know generally how long does it take for hair color to sit in the hair before it's done somewhere between 20 and 45 minutes so that's a long time to get antsy if yes. you don't have anything to do yes okay um some stylists will work on other clients, some stylists will, you know, th there's a lot of things that, that people do during that time. My habit was to stay there with my guest, my salon guest. Um, and now I'm looking back on that, like, why did I do that? Um, was it an attempt to have more control over it? Was it to keep the connection going with my guest? I don't know. I think I'm going to have to do some soul searching on that one. Because to me, it was odd that people would leave their guests, but to them, it was odd that I would stay. So. So we all have different coping mechanisms. Yes. They were coping the way they could. Was yes. there another idea or, or thought that you had that you wanted to share? Yeah, I, I had this moment of confusion because I remember um, many years ago, I went to a self help seminar mm -hmm. and um, it was generally really helpful in my life but one of the messages that always struck me wrong was that there is no hope there's only doing mm -hmm. uh, or there is no hope there's only truth mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and I disagree it's interesting to me that you bring that up in the message version of the Bible and I'm not sure where the verse is so if any of you know feel free to comment in the YouTube section or um, on our Spotify podcast comments or wherever you get your 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 podcast from there's a verse that says self-help is no help at all and if you're going to self-help which is what you went to of course they're gonna tell you you have to work harder or you have to do more because that's all that we can do ourselves to to receive hope to receive trust to receive faith and hold on to those things instead of I have to do more is part of believing in God and trusting that God is going to give you 
faith, hope, love, the assurance that you need so that you can trust him. And if you don't have something bigger than you that you can put your trust and hope into, then yeah, you're just going to work harder. And that's why self-help is no help at all, because there comes a point when we exhaust, we're exhausted. We cannot keep going. There's no more work that we can do. And at that point, there's got to be something else that you cling to. And either it's faith, hope, love, trust in God, or it's going to be more caffeine, more substances that are supposedly going to help you keep working harder, um, you know, exercise, whatever it is that we hold on to that we're trying to do. And the problem is caffeine in and of itself, not bad. Exercise in and of itself, not bad. Being healthy and taking care of yourself, not bad. But like anything, if it becomes your God, if it's the most important thing, then you're going to lose out on relationships. You're going to lose out on all kinds of good things that God wants to bless you with, including rest, being able to appreciate all the blessings that God has given us. And it is difficult, though, how we deal with that time where it's so easy to be impatient and we need to choose hope if we're going to stay sane. Agreed. So, was there anything else that stood out for you in the in this section of the Bible? No, just that, just reframing um, suffering as a gift. Yeah, that was it for me. Excellent. Something else. Uh, this is verses probably 9 and 10. In the Message Bible, they give you kind of a, a chunk that's, so it says 9 through 12. I'm not sure exactly what which verses these would be. But it says, Be assured that from the first day we heard of you, we haven't stopped praying for you, asking God to give you wise minds and spirits attuned to his will. It's so interesting to me because often I want to pray for things. God, if you'll just give me a new RV, if you'll just give me a new truck, if you'll just give me a house, if you'll just give me these things that I think I want, then I will be happy, is the unspoken part that I don't say, but that's what I, I feel. And the prayer that's prayed here is, give you wise minds and spirits attuned to God's will. If I had a wise mind, I might be able to understand that if someone, if I got a home, it would actually drive me nuts. I'm the kind of person who doesn't want to stay in one place for my entire life. I'm the kind of person who will go crazy trying to maintain a home at a high level and anything that goes wrong with that home, I'm going to be frustrated and having a problem with. So if I have a wise mind, I'll know enough about myself that I'm not going to ask for a home. But there are days when my three-year-old comes out and I'm throwing a temper tantrum and I'm tired of living in this RV traveling. And so I pray, God, give me a house in one place so I don't have to live this kind of life anymore. Forgetting that God has blessed me with this kind of life so that he can teach me what he needs to teach me so that I can become who he needs me to be and be able to help other people, love other people well. Yesterday, in a conversation Jen and I had, we were talking about wise, foolish, and evil. And it's so easy to fall into foolishness. And for, like I said, for me, asking for a home is foolish. And it's not evil. I don't have, I don't have malevolent intentions towards anybody. But I do have a foolishness in not understanding what is best for me, what is best for our relationship, what is best for our dog. And I'm just tired. So I, I in my tiredness, in my three-year-old temper tantrum mentality, I want the suffering to stop instead of learning from the suffering. So our prayer is for wise minds and spirits attuned to God's will. And then, of course, at the end of the chapter, one of my favorite parts. 
I so often hear, and this is no longer trending, it's not the newest trend, but the idea of being a basic bitch. <laughs> and the last verse in this chapter is, to be mature is to be basic. Christ, no more, no less. To be mature is to be basic. We get so caught up trying to have things, trying to have all this stuff, and there's nothing wrong with having things. But as soon as my heart turns from Christ to, I need this thing or that thing, or if I just had this, I would be happy. I'm missing out on relationships. I'm missing out on God's blessing. I'm missing out on so many things that God has for me. And I'm trying to control my suffering. And here's the best part. When I look at other people, I actually can't judge them because I don't know their heart. There are plenty of people who I've met who have lots of stuff. They have lots of things, and their heart is all about God. They will let you borrow their stuff. They will give stuff away. They have no problem. They're not trying to hold on to their stuff. And I've also met people who they have an inner vow that says, no one's taking anything from me, and I'm getting everything I can. And... Some of them have a lot of stuff, and some of those people don't really have anything. They're so busy trying to control the things they have that they can't even acquire new things because they just are holding on tight to what they already have. And that doesn't, that's not the kind of life I want to live. I want to hold my hands open and receive whatever God gives me, and then keep my hands open so that if he decides to take those things away, give them to someone else, whatever he wants to do with the things, they're not mine. They're just something that I have stewardship over. They're something I'm taking care of for a little while. Any thoughts on that, my love? I think that when we look at things above relationships, that's where the problem lies. Mm -hmm. I'm, it, I know for a long time it was hard for me to understand, what do you mean I'm, I'm making money my God or I'm making job my job my God? I, I don't understand what that means. Mm -hmm. And I think for me what it means is when I put whatever this idea or thing is above relationships, then, that, then that's where I start to make it my God. And this is one area where we're actually still having a little bit of a communication error because as a man, I generally think about things. As a woman, you generally think about relationships. Mm -hmm. But when I talk about things, relationships are under the heading of things for me. Mm -hmm. And so one of the problems that I don't talk about because I don't think about is what you just brought up. Relationships can be a thing that we look to instead of God. Absolutely. And so... Absolutely. You're correct. It's still, am I getting my emotions met? Am I meeting someone else's emotions? I have empathy and that makes me a good person. I care about individual people more than I care about the majority of people. So as long as I take care of individual people and require the majority of people to take care of the minority of people or the the un the people who are not recognized in society then i'm a good person and that's still an inner vow and all of the different relationship the ways that we make relationships more important than actually honoring god because as soon as you move into relationships are the most important thing well relationships with who you None of us are in relationship with every single human being on the planet. So how could we possibly make the best decisions for the whole planet when we're just trying to take care of the relationships with individual people? And in the same way that money is not a problem, but the love of money is the root of all evil, the love of relationships, the love of having a home, the love of whatever it is, fill in the blank. It's when we put that one thing, that relationship, that whatever it is, the my emotions or someone else's emotions or whatever we put in there, having empathy, being compassionate, when that one thing becomes more important than our relationship with God, 
then we start doing things that actually cause damage to everyone around us and to ourselves. And so... Can you give me an example of that? Sure. Uh, an Oedipal mother. They're so concerned with their relationship to their child that they're using their child to cure their loneliness, to give them hope, to give them all of, to give them love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, and self-control. Well, only God can give us those things. Those are the fruits of the Spirit. When God sends His Holy Spirit to us, He gives us, as a gift, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, and self-control. We get comfort. We don't feel so lonely anymore because we, we know that there's someone who's with us. So what you're saying is when you use your child for those things that only God can give you, mm -hmm. then that's where you're putting that relationship above God. And that's one example yeah. of using relationships inappropriately to get your needs met. And there are millions of others. There right. are so many ways that we can right. go wrong. But that makes that idea that, yeah, makes sense that to makes you. Sense. And then, can you see how you can take that into any other form of relationship? Yeah, I can think of you know, uh, uh, like a married couple. Mm -hmm. When you think that your spouse is supposed to provide all those things for you, not just those things, but all the time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And when they don't, then they're a horrible person, and I need to get a divorce. Right. Because they're supposed to give me all those things all the time. And if they're not, then... Right. I'll move on to the next person. There's nowhere else for me to get it. Right. But the truth is, they weren't supposed to provide that all the time anyway. Mm -hmm. God was supposed to provide that for you. Right. Okay. That makes sense to me. And so... So far in both of those cases, mm -hmm. it's a person expecting the relationship to be the other person is giving me everything. Mm -hmm. There's also the kind of relationship where I believe that I'm going to take care of other people. Mm -hmm. And that's just as problematic if it's more important than my relationship to God. Because once that's sort of the empathy thing. As long as I have empathy for this one person and together we're going to fight everybody else, anybody who hurts this person, I'm going to go fight them. That's still a problem because empathy is a great thing. Being able to meet an individual person where they're at and feel their emotions, validate their emotions, have a great conversation with them, care about them and make them feel cared for is a wonderful thing. But if all you do is empathize with that one person, mm -hmm. you're going to end up hurting all these other people because when that person gets fired from their job, there's no ability to step back into compassion, which is seeing all sides of the story and realize, okay, I'll empathize with you. It sucks to get fired. It's heartbreaking and it hurts. And your hurt is valid and real. Now let's talk about why, let's step back into compassion and talk about why did you get fired? Oh, you didn't show up for work? Oh, you were late? Oh, you didn't actually do your job while you were at your job? You made a contract with these people and told them you were going to do this and you never actually did it. Your, the place that you work at had every right to fire you because you weren't living up to what you were supposed to do. Compassion is being able to step away from the individual person and see the other parts of the story. And if we don't do that, then empathy is the most important thing, then we're going to go to war against this company who hasn't done anything wrong, who is totally within their rights, and we're going to seem like a crazy person. And we are being crazy because we've made empathy more important than rightly relating to God. And rightly relating to God includes understanding God loves us, God has forgiven us, God has made a way for us to be in relationship with Him, and in order to be in relationship with him, we have to stay within his boundaries. We don't get to just do whatever we want and say, oh, God will forgive me. No, no, no. If you want to have actual relationship, and just like if we want to have relationship with God, it's the same with other people. 
Certainly there are people who are doormats and we can walk all over them. Certainly there are people who are tyrants and they'll seem like good leaders for as long as we're aligned with whatever they want. But to have right relationship with God includes empathy and respect balanced out. I think I'm struggling with this idea, so I don't know if it's accurate, but one of the words that we use so poorly in the English language is love. And we claim that women are good at love and they want love. I'm wondering if it's that they actually want empathy. They want to feel connected by we feel each other's feelings. We recognize each other's feelings and we care about each other. And in the English language, we don't use the word empathy, we use the word love. So men want respect. Generally I, speaking. Generally speaking. So in 80% of the time, it this it pretty much works. There's a whole variety of people within that 80%. And then on the outliers, there's you know 10% who are totally emotional and 10% who are totally logical and seem like they don't want what society wants anyway. But generally as a society, men want to feel respected. I know that you are capable, I know that you are, that who you are is capable of doing these things, and today you didn't quite hit the mark. You didn't do as well as you could do. I'm wondering if, when we say women want love, what we actually mean is women want empathy. They want to feel a connection that is based on, you care about my emotions, you understand that I'm having this emotion, you'll meet me in this place where this emotion exists. And that's how we can have relationship. And that doesn't have to be right. Once again, it's an idea or theory. I'm just trying to figure out what words make more sense because love is just, in the English language, especially in American English, the United States' version of English, we we use the word love for everything. I love potato chips. I love my wife. I love going to the theater. I love my car. I love surfing. I love my job. I love, but you don't love doesn't mean the same thing for each one of those things. It's like that kid joke. I love potato chips. Then why don't you marry them? <laughs> there you go. We don't differentiate the different types of love. Right. In our language yeah you're correct we don't um, as a woman I I think I'm gonna so far I haven't to explore it more but so far I, I I would agree with your statement that generally as women we look for we look for somebody to meet us where we're at emotionally um, and then move on from that sure and that's what I wanted to just say. Primarily, yeah. the very first thing men look for is respect. Primarily, the very first thing women look for is empathy, which right. we've been calling love. And there, that's the, this is the idea. It could totally be wrong. I know in my mind, I get sympathy and empathy. Mm -hmm. uh, I confuse the two things. Sure. And so when you say empathy, sometimes I cringe because I'm like, no, I don't want that. <laughs> but that's... That's not accurate. Um, so you don't want sympathy. You don't want someone, or you don't want pity. I don't want pity. That's yeah. what I don't want. Yeah, and sympathy can so easily fall into pity. But empathy is meeting you where you're at emotionally. So yes. you do want empathy. Yeah. Okay. Just trying to clarify for myself. Yeah. Okay. And so that of course becomes problematic in relationships because if you don't balance empathy and respect, if you don't step back from empathy into compassion and he, and be able to have empathy for all of the people within the story instead of just whoever you've made the hero of the story, mm -hmm. there can be problems. And of course in a married relationship, this is one of the biggest struggles because Women want empathy, which also means they're willing to say things that can be hurtful. And then as soon as they apologize and the other person apologizes, that's what builds relationship. Because we're willing, we're not afraid of 
being hurt or hurting each other as long as we connect emotionally. And once again, this is within that 80% range and there's outliers. And I think you, my love, and I are both outliers. So <laughs> it might not feel as good for us, this general idea. And once again, I could be wrong, so don't forget that as well. I'm always willing to be wrong. I'm just trying to figure thing, these things out as I talk about them. But for men, saying I'm sorry can be the worst possible experience that there is because it's admitting weakness. It's, it's, men don't say I'm sorry and mean I'm sorry for what I did. Men say I'm sorry and they mean I must be a terrible person because I wasn't strong enough to do what actually needed to be done. Hmm. Whereas I think generally speaking, remember this is generally speaking, women are able to say I'm sorry and mean I'm sorry for this one particular very specific thing that I did, but I'm only going to say sorry if you say sorry first. I'm going to say you hurt me, which tells the other person to say I'm sorry, and as soon as they say I'm sorry, then I say, oh, I'm sorry too, and then we, we are all better now, and we can be friends because emotionally we connect. Now, once again, Jen, I think you and I are on the outliers. And so for you personally, I'm willing, this might not work. I'm willing to ponder the idea. Sure. I'm willing to think about it. So I'm at, I'm at least open to that. I appreciate that. Thank you. And once again, this could all be ideas that have been created in the media or society. But here's the other thing to remember. I'm not saying this is how all women are. I'm not saying this is how all men are. I'm saying, generally speaking, this is where they start. And the best part of marriage is you have to live with someone of the opposite sex who's going to teach you who they specifically are. So when I made that statement, I know it does not apply to you. I know that you're not personally a woman who likes to relate to other people by saying these things that could be hurtful and then having them apologize and you apologize and now we're all we felt this beautiful resolution so we feel better and now we can be friends. I think that would make you vomit. <laughs> Is that accurate? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You vomit at that idea because you don't fit within that societal idea. As you're describing it, the tone of voice that you have and everything, I'm just cringing over here. <laughs> like, <"Bleh!" laughs> And that's because I hate it. I hate the idea like I said, men don't apologize that way. If you make a man apologize, you're telling him that he has to apologize for who he is. And that's so disrespectful. And once again, this is a general idea, and it could be wrong. Jen's giving me some funky looks. And I'm not trying to give him funky looks. My, As I'm experiencing emotions inside, I cannot keep them off my face. And that's okay. That's, <laughs> that's part of the point. And something that I've had to learn as a husband is to pay attention to your face when we're talking, which doesn't fit for me either, because as a man, I do things shoulder to shoulder. We're not gonna look at each other while we're doing things. When we're doing marriage, as a man, we're doing it shoulder to shoulder. We're, we're together as a team going out to take on whatever the world has for us. We're gonna go out there and hunt together. We're gonna go out there and and do maintenance on the RV together. We're gonna to go out there and do things together and never have to look at each other's face. And that's why it's so funny to see all these girls on TikTok putting up, can you tell the difference between these two looks? All the men are going, no, we're not even looking at your face. We don't even know that you have a look, let alone two different looks. <laughs> we haven't even looked at your face once this whole time. Because, once again, Part of respect is, I know that if I look at you for too long, I'm telling you that I want to fight. And women don't have that. Women want to just stare into each other's eyes forever to figure out each other's emotions. And then you get upset because I won't look at, because you think you're expressing all these things on your face and I should be receiving them. I don't have a receiver for that. I haven't looked at your face this entire conversation. <laughs> and I'm certainly not paying attention to the details that might tell me which emotion you're feeling, because I'm a guy. 
I want to be shoulder to shoulder with both of us looking out and having the same vision of what we're doing out there. I don't want to be right here because I can't even tell what your face is trying to tell me. So these are all our crazy ideas and could totally be wrong and I don't mind being wrong but it's it's what I think is part of what's going on and particularly in society today with all this identity and all these questions about who I am and what my identity is and all of that um, this idea that society defines who you have to be as a man or a woman I totally disagree I totally disagree society gives you a general idea of what women might be like and what men might be like as a starting point so that you can have some feeling of safety as you move into the scariest thing of all which is putting yourself in a position where you could be rejected by someone of the opposite gender the opposite sex that's one of the scariest things for everybody because we want to be liked and when you're dealing with people of the same gender it's not it's not a big problem um, but when you're dealing with someone of the opposite gender they don't we've just talked about some some of the many different ways that we don't approach the world in the same manner and so we need a starting point that feels safe so that we can build from it, okay, who is this individual person and how can I relate to them? And all of this is under the umbrella of if I'm relating to God correctly, then I will be able to relate to people correctly. But if I'm trying to get what I want out of this relationship or out of this thing, I'm going to miss the right way to have relationship no matter what. Thank you all for being with us today. Uh, follow and subscribe on Twitch to chat with us. Like, comment, and subscribe on YouTube and wherever you get your podcast from. Thank you for joining us on this adventure. Much love. Tell the adventurers, explore.